Edinburgh, the capital of Scotland and part of the United Kingdom, is recognized as one of Europe's most beautiful cities. It attracts visitors from all over the world who are intrigued by its towering spires and age-old history. But Edinburgh is also rumored to be one of Britain's most haunted cities. Uneasy spirits prowl through the dark alleyways, towering castles, and musty underground basements of the ancient city. Some come to seek eternal solitude. Others return to wreak havoc and vengeance. There are many reasons why Edinburgh had a reputation, or has a reputation for being such a haunted place. Um, this city was savage. It was overcrowded, there was, there was crime everywhere. We have quite a, a long, long history in Edinburgh and a lot of very strange things happening. Everywhere you go, there's a ghost somewhere. People from all over the world, people who've never been to Edinburgh before, will see the same ghosts that 20 people before them have seen. And that really reinforced my belief that there's, there's something going on down here. And yes, it does scare me. Edinburgh has a rich but troubled legacy, a place once plagued by foreign invasions, disease, and religious persecution. The city has been occupied since the Bronze Age, but took shape during the 11th century. I think Edinburgh is regarded as, as haunted because so many of the original buildings are still standing, which the architecture, the whole kind of history is there. It's visual, you can see it, you can see the buildings. But if a building's old, it's bound to have lots of stories attached to it, good ones, bad ones. Holyrood Palace is one of the impressive structures still standing at the end of the city's Royal Mile. The palace is Queen Elizabeth's official Scottish home. But some say former monarchs still haunt the royal residence. The name Holyrood, meaning Holy Cross, originated from a mystical incident that dates back to 1128. The reigning king, David I, was on a hunting expedition when an aggressive stag knocked him off his horse. The beast charged at him. Legend says that King David tried to fight off the wild animal when a cross miraculously appeared in his hands. The stag disappeared and the monarch's life was spared. The pious king constructed the Holyrood Abbey to pay homage to the symbolic cross. His later successor, King James IV, built the Holyrood Palace next to the abbey in 1498. Many royal families lived in the palatial estate, including Scotland's beloved Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary was a beautiful and clever ruler, but the Catholic Queen's reign came at a time when the country was converting to Protestantism. Mary, Queen of Scots, was Queen of Scots in the 16th century. This was a very difficult time as the Reformation in Europe had swept right across Britain and including Scotland. Mary was very young when she came to the throne, um, and she was also a Roman Catholic, and this made her position very difficult. She was also a woman in what was mostly a man's world. In 1565, Queen Mary married Henry Lord Darnley, a younger man known more for his dashing looks than his intelligence. Mary quickly grew bored with her husband and began spending more time with David Rizzio, her handsome Italian secretary. Darnley suspected his wife was having an affair with Rizzio and plotted his demise. On the evening of March 9, 1566, Mary, Rizzio and her attendants were dining at Holyrood. A group of assassins led by the jealous Lord Darnley charged the palace. Rizzio was seized and dragged into another room where he was stabbed 56 times. It seems Rizzio's grisly murder has left a grim legacy at Holyrood. 
Visitors to the palace have developed unexplainable headaches in the room where it is believed he was murdered. Other paranormal episodes have also been reported at Holyrood. There was a, a story uh, in Edinburgh going around about the palace that in fact the spot where David Rizzio was murdered, uh, there was a blood stain on the floor, which no matter how people tried, just couldn't be washed off. During the 1980s, another strange phenomenon occurred. A palace security guard experienced a biting chill in the air and the sound of footsteps when no one was around. Could this have been the ghost of David Rizzio? Other witnesses claim to have seen Mary, Queen of Scots ghost strolling through the palace. After Rizzio's brutal murder, Mary feared for her own life. In 1567, when Lord Darnley was found strangled to death, the Queen became a suspect. Implicated in the murder by some, both because she was a Catholic and because um, she was becoming increasingly unpopular. And when she remarried, this again made her even more unpopular, and sections of Scottish society then rose against her. She was imprisoned, and she had abdicated while she was in prison. Mary escaped from prison and fled to England in 1568. She had hoped her cousin, Elizabeth I, would protect her. But Elizabeth, a staunch Protestant, feared that Mary might be a danger to her throne due to numerous Catholic uprisings. Mary was eventually implicated in a plot to overthrow Elizabeth and sentenced to death. On February 8, 1587, the 45-year-old Scottish Queen was beheaded in a castle located in Northampton, England. The tragic heroine's memory is said to live on at Holyrood Palace. Holyrood Palace is probably haunted or at least reputedly haunted. One of the ghost stories involves a grey lady in the picture gallery and this has been identified by some as the ghost of Mary, Queen of Scots. Holyrood is just one of many royal palaces believed to be haunted. Edinburgh Castle is known to have its own collection of spirits. The fortress was built on top of a non-active volcano and was the monarchy's residence from the 6th century until 1603. Since then, stories spread throughout the city that the castle contained mysterious underground tunnels which were haunted. We'd find passageways, uh, cellars that people didn't know existed from previous buildings, and I think that probably brought in an, an aurora of uh, hidden buildings, hidden passages, which then would tie into ghosts uh, and spooks. There had been rumours for some time that one secret underground passageway extended from Edinburgh Castle to Holyrood Palace, almost a mile away. The tunnel was supposedly used by monarchs who wanted to make a quick exit if the castle was under siege. According to legend, a young bagpiper was sent down to the basement of Edinburgh Castle to see if this passageway actually stretched to Holyrood. The idea being that as these pipes were playing, you would hear the music and be able to trace them on the ground. Unfortunately, the sound of his pipes became dimmer and dimmer, and eventually they couldn't be heard at all. And it is said from time to time now that the sounds of pipes can still be heard um, from this poor man who got lost in the tunnels. The bagpiper's strange disappearance, centuries ago, has left an eerie reverberating sound throughout the city. In the middle of the night, in the still Edinburgh night, in the darks of winter, you can still be heard the ghostly strains of a phantom piper. The phantom piper is just one of the many Scottish ghost stories that has stretched across the centuries. Some tourists are now curious to visit the places where strange sightings have been reported. But a cemetery in the heart of Edinburgh has become a place to beware. The ominous graveyard is the site where the dead are said to prey upon the living.
Graveyards are typically places where the dead rest in peace. But at Greyfriars Kirk Cemetery in Edinburgh, the deceased souls are anything but peaceful. Several bizarre and violent attacks on tourists have been reported here in the past year. The unexplained episodes have led many to believe that the grounds are haunted by a vindictive poltergeist, an unworldly predator who assaults those who trespass through the cemetery. The origins of these attacks are believed to be buried in Edinburgh's bloody history. Scotland and England, the two major kingdoms on the island of Britain, were in conflict with each other for hundreds of years. During the 13th and 14th centuries, England invaded Scotland and was eventually defeated with the efforts of William Wallace, better known as Braveheart, as well as the famed warrior and king, Robert the Bruce. 300 years later, in 1603, the two countries united in what was called the Union of the Crowns. But the bloodshed did not stop. A bitter religious war ignited and divided Scotland for the rest of the century. After the Reformation in Scotland in the mid-16th century, uh, there was much conflict between those who wanted to keep the old church, the Roman Catholic Church, and those who wanted a Protestant church and then laterally between those who wanted an Episcopalian church and those who wanted a Presbyterian one. The Covenanters, a radical Presbyterian group, rejected the Episcopalian views of King Charles I of England and Scotland. They raised a fierce army to defend their traditional religious beliefs. The Scottish Covenanters fought numerous wars against King Charles, but they were finally suppressed. 1,200 Covenanters were imprisoned within Greyfriars Churchyard without food and water for nearly five months. In the end, Lord Advocate George Mackenzie, an Edinburgh judge known as Bloody Mackenzie, sentenced hundreds of Covenanters to death by hanging. Many were buried at the Covenanters' prison that is now located within Greyfriars Cemetery. Some believe these persecuted souls have returned to haunt the burial grounds. Most of the ghosts are said to be docile creatures. But over the last year, a sinister spirit has apparently emerged from the dead. Some people think it's haunted by the Covenanters. Some people think it's haunted by Bloody Mackenzie himself. We call it the Mackenzie Poltergeist because the first it basically attacks people and uh, that's why we think it's not a ghost because ghosts in legend don't do that. Poltergeist lore, however, is all about invisible entities that knock people down, make rapping noises and that's what seems to happen. Jan Henderson has led nightly tours through Greyfriars Cemetery since 1999. Although he's never personally been attacked, he has witnessed tourists being viciously mauled by what he believes is an invisible demon. The Covenanters prison is locked now um, because of the attacks, but it has been open for literally for hundreds of years and nothing ever happened to people in there. Um, they used to wander in the night with impunity and it's only in the last maybe year and a half that these attacks have started. Fourteen people knocked unconscious and innumerable scratches, cuts, bruises. It's almost like it picks them out from the herd. Drives them that way and as soon as they get to the doorway down they go and they'll just collapse. They normally stay unconscious for two or three minutes. No one has been able to offer an explanation for these alleged attacks, but local newspapers interviewed and photographed some of the victims who reported deep cuts and bruises on their face and hands. My first impression was it was very interesting, um, and I was a... Jan Rees, who lives in northern Scotland, recalls a frightening encounter she had while touring Greyfriars in May of 2000. We were standing um, outside this vault and uh, I felt as though someone was touching the back of my head. I looked around to see if anyone was there. There was no one because they were all standing away from me. Then when we went into the vault, we sort of were led in here by the guide. And we were standing 
and uh, I suddenly started to feel very, very sick and nauseated. Um, it just rose up suddenly. I couldn't explain why. Um, I thought I was either going to be sick or faint, and I just wanted to get out. But when I did get outside, I realised that my face was completely numb. It was cold. It was so cold that I couldn't feel my fingers touching it. And that sensation must have lasted for about 15, 20 minutes before the feeling re returned. But I was pretty sceptical about the whole thing. I thought it was something that was just fabricated for tourists, you know? Um, but I don't know. That's changed my mind. Very much so. But uh, I wouldn't like to come back by myself. Many wonder why this evil creature assaults some visitors and not others. The tour guides have their own theory. We think that people produce pheromones, types of hormones, when they're scared. And that's why a poltergeist wants to scare you. I don't know, feeds on it, it makes it stronger. And we think that that's the reason that, that sort of children entering their teenage years or pregnant women maybe have some kind of hormone that, that just attracts this thing. And more things happen when there is a pregnant person or a child of around 11 or 12 on the tour than any other time. And I've been in there lots and lots of times and nothing's happened to me. So, I'm a realistic person. If nothing happens to me, I'll keep going in until something does. Those who believe in ghosts think the shocking attacks at Greyfriars may be connected to the religious persecution that occurred centuries ago. But the medieval cemetery is not the only place where the tortured have allegedly returned to torment the living. On West Bow Street, in the heart of Old Town Edinburgh, local citizens have reported seeing the ghostly figure of a fanatical preacher who was sentenced to death for practicing witchcraft and sorcery. The 17th century was a time of great fear and anxiety in Europe regarding the practice of witchcraft. Scotland was no exception. The widespread hysteria led to witch hunts and the execution of thousands. Major Thomas Weir was one of the victims. Weir, a former soldier, was a religious zealot. He led many Protestant prayer groups in Edinburgh during the late 1600s. But rumors spread around town that there was something strange about the preacher. He never knelt in church and smelled of brimstone. He also carried a twisted stick that he claimed acted as his servant. In 1670, the aging preacher finally admitted to his religious followers that he was a closet warlock. Weir and his elder sister, Grizzle, secretly practiced witchcraft in the home they shared. Thomas Weir confessed to demonic pact being involved with the devil. He confessed to having had incestuous relationships with his sister, indulging in sexual practices with other women, even bestiality. He didn't confess to harming anyone, which was also unusual in itself. Because it was such a shock from this, for this very pious gentleman to have confessed to such heinous things. Some members of his religious group tried to get him examined by a physician at the time to say that he must be having some mental breakdown, perhaps he was mentally disturbed. But doctors diagnosed we are sane. As a result, he and his sister were charged with sorcery. On April 11th, 1670, Thomas Weir was sentenced to death, burned at the stake along with his twisted stick. Many claimed that Satan himself came to Edinburgh on a black coach and escorted him to hell. Weir's sister Grizzle was hanged the next day in the city square. When she was being executed, she took off her clothes. She, she made quite a spectacle of herself uh, at, on the episode at the time. And this again added to the whole shocking episode that these two brother and sister, who were very religious, were suddenly confessing to horrendous things. The Weir's home became one of the most haunted places in Edinburgh. It was torn down in 1830, but witnesses have testified seeing the transparent figure of Thomas Weir riding a horse surrounded by flames. 
Others claim to have heard the tapping of Weir's twisted stick on the cobbled streets of the city. The ghost of Thomas Weir has become a famous Scottish legend, but he is not the only notable soul said to be lurking around Edinburgh. A team of psychics and ghost hunters claim they discovered a special doorway that leads to an endless world of spirits and ghosts. This 15th century Scottish chapel is thought to be one of the most mystical places in the world. It's been compared to the great pyramids in Egypt because of its connection to the afterlife. Roslyn Chapel, seven miles south of Edinburgh, is believed to contain an invisible doorway leading to the world of spiritual creatures. Roslyn Chapel was commissioned in 1446 by Sir William St. Clair, the Earl of Orkney. Some speculate the ornate chapel was modeled after King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. This biblical connection has led many to believe the chapel possesses a magical aura and serves as a sanctuary for ghostly beings from around the world. True believers in the supernatural have made pilgrimages to Roslyn to test its powers. Ghost hunters Brian Allen and Billy Devlin have visited Roslyn Chapel several yeah. times. Psychics Anne-Marie Snetton and Jim Lockhead have accompanied them on many of their assignments. We investigate basically any kind of phenomena that needs investigations. I mean, everything from UFOs to ghosts, paranormal sightings, poltergeists, poltergeist, yeah. and it's when we brought them along that we found there was an incredible psychic uh, presence in the place as well, spiritual energy, spiritual energy as well. It's almost like a meeting point of energies, different energies. I mean, the whole place is just buzzing. The paranormal investigators use a tri-field meter, a standard piece of equipment for ghost hunters. They believe the field strength on the meter increases when spirits are present. We also have temperature readings, because occasionally there's, there's always a, a drop in temperature before something actually happens, or sometimes it's a rising temperature, it's a temper, temperature fluctuation. When we've been here previously, the power, the, the power was incredible. The sense of presence of it being there. I mean, I ain't no lightweight guy, and I mean, I was, I was literally off the floor. I was, must have been half an inch, an inch off the floor, straight up. My arms were floating up from my sides. I got as I came in, and as if the floorboards were moving up and down, like being on a ship. Uh, a tremendous feeling uh, as well, so the place is absolutely moving. The psychics have often made contact with a Templar knight at Roslyn, who they say marched from Scotland to Jerusalem during the Crusades. They have also seen a monk strolling through the chapel courtyard. There seems to be um, some sort of activities being taken place. Um, someone else has discovered this doorway and is trying to open it. Inside the chapel, the team typically stands over a tomb where they believe exists an astral doorway, an entranceway where the dead and living can be transported back and forth in time. We discovered there's an astral doorway here, and an astral doorway is um, you know how when people have near-death experiences, they talk about um, going up a tube? Well, if you can imagine, there's a big tube here, and it allows you to go to different astral dimensions. It's a bit like stepping through a stargate. You, know, it, you don't know where you're going to end up. It's another dimension, another time, another place, another reality. Yeah. Right now, the astral doorway is closed, according to psychics Anne-Marie and Jim but they hope this portal will open one day so they can visit the souls who have passed on. The reason that the astral doorway isn't open at present is that our psychic colleagues feel that it, it represents a danger in that both things, both physical and spiritual, can go through from both directions, good and bad, exactly. It can only be opened by a certain way, some kind of a ceremony or some kind of meditation and we just want to be here when it breaks or when, when the doorway opens. That's the best way of putting it, but we want to be here when it happens. Yeah. Yeah. 
The paranormal investigators believe they are on the brink of discovering the ultimate gateway to the spiritual world. But Roslyn Chapel is only one of several places said to be inhabited by ghosts. The most famous location is an abandoned underground city that is considered to be one of the most haunted sites in all of Edinburgh. Edinburgh is a picturesque city, bustling with tourists who have stimulated Scotland's growing economy. But below street level exists the remains of an underground slum, a spine-chilling place with a dismal past. These hidden passageways are said to be haunted by those who once lived in a cave-like existence. Today, the curious venture down into these dark corridors hoping to catch a glimpse of a ghost or goblin. The origins of this underground metropolis began in the 1600s when a massive wall was built around Edinburgh to protect its citizens from foreign invasion. Edinburgh became the most densely populated city in Europe during the Middle Ages. As a result, the poor were forced to live in underground tenements, teeming with poverty and crime. Edinburgh has a history of being a haunted city. Uh, I would say basically because of the way people lived in those days, having to live in such close confinement. These subterranean vaults were used for over 350 years until they were abandoned in the 18th century. But many believe wicked spirits still wander through the maze of dark and damp hallways. We are standing underneath the South Bridge in Edinburgh in passageways and chambers that have been closed up for over 200 years. They were used as workshops and houses and storage areas for shops and businesses up on the South Bridge and they were discovered in the 1980s and excavated. We started taking people down here and telling them Edinburgh ghost stories and a little bit of the history of the place and as time went on gradually more and more things began to happen. This room we believe was used as a um, cobbler's workshop and one of the first psychics that we brought down here said that there was quite a lot of psychic activity in this room. A terrifying ghost called the Mad Woman is one of the most frequently cited apparitions in the cobbler's room. She is said to push or shove anyone who enters the area. The suggestion that we've had from various people who have seen her or contacted her is that she, or oh, something terrible happened to her, she lost a child or, or her, her husband had fathered a child by another woman or, or she had a, a miscarriage. Some of the spirits I truly believe are, are benign, they are friendly, they like a, a us being here, they're, they're appreciative of our presence. So there's a bit of a mixture, I think there's a bit of a power struggle going on with the ghosts in here, the good ones and the bad ones. There have been many, many experiences had by, by people in this room. It's one of the most haunted rooms in the vaults, without a doubt. The gentleman who breathes on people and who speaks to them and whispers in their ear, his main characteristic is that he wears a pair of big black leather boots and he stomps. People hear his footsteps coming up the corridor behind them. Many believe the fiendish figure named Mr. Boots was a slum landlord who charged too much rent to his tenants. Some speculate he scares away those who trespass on his property. We had a young lady on our tour called Emma, had come on the tour and said to us, I am actually very psychic and there are lots of things in your vaults. Well, we were walking up the corridor and Emma just stopped dead in her tracks and she said she had met Mr. Boots, this, this very unpleasant character, standing in the corridor and he was, he was blocking the path. And she said he just went at her with the knife. So it was a very scary experience for everybody, that one. The vaults are only a portion of Edinburgh's haunted underground city. Several blocks away, a subterranean street is said to be inhabited by former residents who lie in wait for intruders. 
Several narrow alleys called closes were built around the city during the 17th century. Mary King's close was one of the streets. No one knows who Mary King was, but the close named after her was plagued by one of Europe's worst epidemics. Death and decay are still felt by the thousands who visit the underground road each year. Mary King's close uh, now is probably the, the most famous uh, haunted site anywhere in Edinburgh. And Mary King's Close originally would have looked rather similar to this one here, open to the skies with very tall buildings on either side. The population was densely packed in, living literally on top of each other. Mary King's Close was a prosperous, bustling street until the Great Plague swept through the city in 1645. Officials sealed off the close to try to contain the spread of the disease. The quarantined were trapped and left to die. Edinburgh lost 10,000 souls, many of whom lived along Mary King's Close. Not only was Mary King's Close the last arresting place of the plague, it was also haunted. And it is recorded that children used to run down the close and shout through the broken windows and run out again with palpitating hearts. Mary King's Close remained derelict and desolate until the mid-18th century when the buildings were demolished and the street was built over. The Close was reopened in the 1990s and the reports of ghostly apparitions have attracted tourists from around the world. The contrast with the, the street we were just standing in couldn't be clearer. This is Mary King's Close as it is now, no longer open to the skies. The building's sliced off and built on top of. But the lower floors of the buildings remain. Many people that come on the tours have unusual experiences. People have set foot at the very bottom of the close and within minutes have turned and fled. Others have burst into tears, feeling simply a great wave of emotion. I've seen people that have fainted dead away because of things they've seen. Many visitors claim to see a tall lady dressed in black drifting through basement corridors. Some speculate she is Mary King, for whom the street was named. Another number of people have also reported what may be the victims of the plague. In one chamber, a whole stack of bodies. Perhaps the room was used as a temporary morgue. People have seen limbs bloated with the same symptoms of the, of the plague. The skin cracking, the enormous uh, boils appearing on the flesh. A girl named Annie is the most famous plague victim to haunt Mary King's Close. Many believe the child was abandoned by her parents and left to die during the epidemic. There was a film crew from Japan who were travelling round Scotland, visiting old castles, visiting ancient haunted places, and they came to Mary King's Close because it's so famous within the city of Edinburgh. The lady that accompanied them, a well-known psychic, she saw a little girl, about eight years old, wearing ragged, rough clothes with a dirty, tear-stained face and long, matted hair. For people in Japan, to lay a gift for the ancestors is a way of appeasing them, of making them rest at peace. And that lady placed in the window, in Annie's room, a small doll wearing a tartan skirt. And many others have followed her example. It's said, because of all the gifts that have been left, especially the toys that other children have supplied just for Annie, that she is no longer the sad figure that she once was. That's known as Annie's room. Here you can see the many things that have been left to the memory of Annie and all those that died as a sort of shrine to the devastation of the plague in 1645. And here, marking where Annie was first Recorded is the doll left as a gift to her. In June of 2000, two students from Edinburgh spent the night in Mary King's Close. They wanted to see for themselves if the place was haunted. They said the experience was unnerving. This is actual videotape recorded during their overnight stay. This is one of the most scariest places in this whole place, in the whole underground thing. I can't really explain why. It's probably because you can't see 
God, I'm so, that does scare me. <laughs> the fearless duo believe they captured several strange phenomena on videotape, including eerie sounds. And we've just heard some really bad sounds coming from down this way. Probably machinery, but it's very irregular. Shall we take a look? See. Or shall we not take a look, guys? <laughs> the students tape this scene in Annie's room. They believe they captured the shadowy image of the young plague victim. I'm not so sure about whether I believe in ghosts or not. But certainly, I probably far more now than I did when I first started about five years ago, taking people through Mary King's Close in the underground vaults. So many strange things have occurred. Perhaps the worst experience, though, was about a year and a half ago. I was leading a tour in the middle of the afternoon, not even at night, through the chambers of Mary King's and felt a very, very heavy hand land on my shoulder. I'm putting it politely, it wrenched the thing out of its socket. I didn't mention this to anyone for fear that my sanity was rapidly escaping me. Mary King's Close has a long list of recorded paranormal events, but the famous street is not the only place that terrifies visitors. A 13th century Scottish castle turned hotel is another site where only the strong-willed have dared to spend the night. This majestic castle represents a rich tradition of Scottish heritage and hospitality. It also stands as a reminder of the chilling incidents that happened within its stone walls. Dalhousie Castle was built in 1247 by Semidus Ramsay, a French nobleman and infamous border raider. The fortress was defended against foreign invasions by many of Ramsay's descendants, including William Ramsay, who joined forces with King Robert the Bruce in the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314. The Ramsay clan witnessed much bloodshed during the 850 years the family owned the castle. Hundreds of years later, in 1974, Dalhousie was converted into a hotel and soon after, strange tales of ghostly encounters began to surface. Lady Catherine is the most commonly seen apparition in the castle. She was the wealthy daughter of one of the owners who lived there during the late 1600s. Catherine was punished by her parents for fraternizing with a male staff member of a lower class. She was locked in an upstairs bedroom with nothing but bread and water, for a year. Alone and neglected, she eventually died of starvation. Today, many believe Lady Catherine has returned to find her lover. Well, I met up with a young apparition, the young lady, about five years ago or so. Well, the young lady, being Lady Catherine, of course, walked the corridors to the rear of the castle, and that is where I first met with her. It was not a frightening experience, it was unusual. And as I talk today, I can see her in my mind's eye. She just walked in a backward fashion through a locked door. I can assure you that made me stand still. A canine ghost has also been seen and heard throughout Dalhousie. In the 1980s, a dog named Petra climbed up to the castle tower and accidentally fell to his death. Ever since, Petra's spirit has been seen running up the stairs and along corridors. Visitors have also heard the pattering of his paws. Staff workers have not only heard the footsteps of Petra, they also have seen mysterious medieval footprints which they believe belong to a former inhabitant of the castle. In September 97, as recent as that, I came down about 8 o'clock in the morning and the staff were looking very concerned and they wondered what happened because they couldn't explain these medieval shaped footprints in the dust that was in the corridor. Well, in fact, the corridor was actually washed the night before and they weren't the normal size, they were very close together, like a sort of shuffle. I certainly do believe it's haunted, yes, yes. 
I've met a lot of guests and staff throughout the years who have told me many stories about um, experiences that they've had in the castle. I've only experienced one, one experience behind the chapel. I was serving drinks and I was standing behind the chapel waiting on people coming through for drinks and I could feel my hair gently being pulled which gave me a bit of a fright uh, and it was just gently being pulled until it was actually my hair bobble was taken out of my, he my head which gave me an awful fright and I ran away screaming through the back of the chapel and I didn't go back down there again unless I was accompanied by someone. Um, that, so that was quite scary and a few times I've been in different parts of the castle and I can feel a presence, although I haven't seen anything, I always feel there's someone there watching. Another eerie episode left a staff worker in tears. A waitress at Dalhousie was overcome with sadness when she claimed to have seen a feeble butler covered in cobwebs roaming through the dining room. Some speculate he was a former employee who had returned to serve the new owners of the castle. Unexplained sightings at Dalhousie continue to baffle the staff and guests. The haunted castle symbolizes the mystical powers that many feel exist in Edinburgh. The medieval city has progressed with modern times. Wars, plagues and merciless executions have disappeared from this now storybook setting. But the tales and legends of ghosts will always be a part of Edinburgh, Scotland. I do believe in ghosts. Uh, I think it is very arrogant of, of us to assume that just because we can't prove it's there doesn't mean to say that it doesn't exist. I don't know about any of the, the scientific evidence about it at all. I think that's very hard to prove one way or the other. I think you've just got to take people's experiences and uh, accept them. If there are ghosts at all, then I'm sure Edinburgh has more than its fair amount of them. It spread throughout India, Asia, and the Middle East. There was no way to fight it. It was an invisible enemy. Over 600 years ago, the Black Death split Europe in half. The ones who died, and the ones who awaited their turn. The Plague.